praise the Lord. Greetings, seekers of Jesus. This is Ronald Simeon. The book is Love Letters from Your Father. And we're in now the second book of John in Lectio Divina, the epistles of John. We had said before that people don't seem to ever hear the epistles of John, the three epistles that he wrote. They know all about the epistles of Paul and which keeps repeating. Once in a while they get the epistles of Peter, but Epistles of Paul, of Peter, uh, of John, rather, are just about ignored. And I'm telling you now that in the first epistle of John that we're continuing here is that I'm so excited I can hardly contain myself because he he talks to the Christians of the first generation after all the apostles, the other apostles are gone or dead, and he observes their practice of the Christian faith in the different churches of, well, we say Asia Minor, near Ephesus, where he was, but of the whole world. Of, it's been extended now all the way to Rome, to Malta, to North Africa to Ethiopia and spreading rapidly from the acts of the from the apostles one of the apostles Thomas is all the way into India and the epistles of John now he's evaluating and talking about what they should know and how they should reach out to Jesus there are so many areas of what we're saying here. Uh, when I uh, started writing the, this book, this book here, say, do you have, do you find it hard to know how to personally apply the scriptures to yourself, to your own life? And do you, in your prayer, do you feel unsure of how the Lord speaks to you? We know how you speak to the Lord in prayer, but how does he speak back to you? Oh, I was out witnessing and uh, met this couple, and I said, uh, you know, they, they're Christians, and they, they're very dynamic. I'm sure they were Protestants, but very dynamic. And they said that, you know, it's strange, he says, how when they witness to people that people say, isn't that strange what you're telling me? You're telling me how God speaks to you. You know, they wonder whether or not you're some kind of a child at Fatima that uh, the Virgin Mary comes and talks to you or an angel talks to you and then you pass it on to people. Well, in John, he says pretty clearly, you read that first chapter and you meditate on it, you're going to see something that is very significant on this point. What if you said to people, this is what God told me, this is what Jesus said to me in my prayer. Lexa to Bina. Passing on the inspiration that God gives you when you read that scripture, that Bible, and you place yourself into the presence of Jesus and you listen to him. Now we're placing ourselves now in the presence of John. To Jesus through John. It's still Jesus, but through John. And John says something very significant. Is the first thing I want to tell the Christians and remind you that you're all saying, oh, now all the apostles 
have died or they're, they're away and uh, we don't they're in different countries but and John is here and how we wish that we could have been there with you when Jesus spoke to you for those three years when he gave you teaching when you uh, observed his miracles when you saw how he related to people how he practice the virtues, practice the message of his father to the people, and how dynamic he was. And so much so that the Jews said, if we, if we don't stop this man, this prophet, the whole nation will go after him. And now they see nations coming after Jesus. But if we could have only been there, and John says to them in this chapter, we want to tell you that what we're going to speak to you about is what we ourselves, what we apostles saw of Jesus, how we heard him. And it was so marvelous and, and so continuous to the present day that if we were to put it in a book, it would take all the volumes of the world. Of course, that time, books were scrolls, not as voluminous as volumes today. So, it might sound like an exaggeration, but they wrote in scrolls, they wrote by hand. And when they called it a, a book an edition, they usually meant that they made Ten copies of it, and sent it to one, one to ten different cities. And then those people could copy it. And that's how it was at those times before the printing press. But that's what he said. And he's saying to the Christians, "Don't worry about." It. You think that when you come to Jesus, you make the same mistake that we made. We said that we came to Jesus, that we followed him, that we called him. You call yourselves the followers of Jesus. It's not exactly true. Read John 10 of the Good Shepherd. And Jesus says so clearly. You're not following me. I called you first. The first movement was me. I called you. You did not call me. But then you followed me. The Holy Spirit spoke to you and you followed me. You know, I saw, for instance, the picture of Michelangelo, a famous picture and I put it in my book and here it is if I find it here here it is. recognize that picture the finger of God touching the finger of Adam and giving him life, the creation of man. And when I was meditating on this, and I said, in the word from the words of John, that's the figure of Jesus. Right now, in my meditation, in my lecture divina, that was the finger of Jesus. And the other finger going by was mine. I was dead. I had no life. And Jesus moves his finger into mine and a spark. As a spark, not of life for me, 
but of recognition, of connection. And that's what John is saying here in his epistle. Jesus connects to you. We're familiar with that in the teaching on the Eucharist, that we can speak to Jesus in the Eucharist for the 15 minutes of the bread and wine is in our bodies, or the host is in our bodies. We speak to him directly. We're not those that run out of church or start talking to the neighbors as soon as the mass is over or run out the door. We were taught that at least for 15 minutes, as the species is in you, Jesus is there. But in the scripture, and when we read the Gospels, we read the epistles, the New Testament, Jesus is present to us as we read, as we begin to pray and meditate and see Jesus' presence. What is it? We are being connected to the Father through Jesus Christ. We're being connected in our prayer to Jesus, through Jesus Christ. When we go to Mass, the bread and wine is changed to transubstantiated to the body and blood of Christ. So when we receive him, we're in communion with him. We're in come with union, in union with Jesus. Now, let us follow this epistle. Jesus is here. He's here in his word. He's here in his spirit. We go to communion, he's here bodily. So we want to say to the Lord, yes, you were present to the apostles. Be present to me. We're going to see how he is present to us. When we were talking in the previous video, we were talking about values. And we said that values are the things that motivate, the desired goals that motivate us to our actions. Let us look at our actions as Christians. Well, we have virtues and we have vices. What are our values? How do we act? By what principle and what goal do we have in our actions? Well, we have to talk about it very directly. You know? Uh, Usually, in a certain local newspaper, I'm <laughs> in my age, I look at the obituaries and I want to pray for the persons that have died and see what they say about their life. And they say, they, one I read just yesterday, and it says, died at age 64. He had a job as a roofer. And now he is died. He leaves many friends apart, away. And he, normally he went fishing. I, would, I kind of weep over that. My brother, a human being, they have nothing to say about him. And in fact, it says, 
he is not going to have any kind of service at his own request. Nothing. Don't have to commemorate his death. Don't have to build a memorial to him. Don't have to say anything special. Kind of sad. I see ourselves in life, there are two values. God's will and man's will. We have a choice. We have free will. What do we act? Our will over God's. Even when Jesus said the Lord's Prayer. When he said the Lord's Prayer, what did he say? Thy will be done on earth. God's will be done. Be done by whom? Through me. Through me, through each Christian that's a follower of Jesus. Jesus didn't come to say, Thy will be done on earth, and I did the will of the Father alone. He passed it on to us. But what is man's will? We know what man's will is. Whatever we're doing, whatever activity, just count down yourself what your activities are. We have just a space of life. People say, how long How long have you been living? Well, that much, that much, that much. Whatever it is, there's a beginning and there's an end. What do we accomplish in that time? Each day we are writing page of our life, a chapter of our life over the last each decade of 10 years. Can you go through a diary and say what you've accomplished in each decade, what has occurred to you? And then, what is the most important chapter? The last one. What is the most important line? The last one. When a person dies, we always want to know their last word. We know Jesus' last word. Father, I have done your will. It's consummated. I give my spirit into your hands. My spirit, the spirit that is connected to you. That is the same spirit that you have. The spirit of doing your will into your hand. That last chapter, that last word is so important. We have a sacrament called extra function for that. But while we're living in this space of life that we have, we don't know how big it is, What do I act out of life? What will be said of me? What will God say of me? What will I answer to him? Life, this is sound a little changing. Life is a confusion. Let's face it. Life is a confusion. We want to plan it and say, well, this goes along, and we went to school, and we got married, or we accomplished this, we have this profession, we got this degree and that degree, and we made a good living, and we went on vacation. It sounds so normal, but it for real happiness and real satisfaction and ha making a difference that we were in life. Making a difference. Leaving a legacy. A trace at least. Don't have to leave our name. 
but we made something better, someone better. We accomplished something that was better than it was before. We all know, we read the newspapers and hear what's going on. Life is confusion all around us. People are disturbed and they have to they have to make sure that other people do what we want them to do. We're going to go to what John says now. I'm so exciting in, in it. To do the will of man is the sin of pride. What is pride? Look in the scripture. And I have a book right here. And there's over a, a hundred different quotations from scripture and then more from the fathers of the church in regard to pride. One that impresses me so much is one from Ecclesiastes that says pride is the center of all sin. I was going to talk about say the seven capital sins to say doing man's will but we don't have to go through all of them because pride is the devil's sin, the diabolical sin. Undoing the will of God. Undoing the will of God. Not doing it and undoing it. Pride initiates all sin. It's the essence of all sin. We eliminate pride because it's connected to all the different virtues. Pride destroys all the virtues. Learn from me, for I am meek and humble of heart. Right now, I see that there is going to be a big conference on secularism. Catholics connected to Jesus, professionals, theologians are going to come together and talk about the danger of secularism in our world. We sure know about that. But you know that pride, pitting, which is also the main sin of idolatry, of humans deciding that sir, so important so, so much focus on their will and on their desires and their determination to control whatever is around them, to give the answers to everything over what is in the scriptures, over what God says, over what God says in Revelations. Gnosticism, that we know it all, we have all the answers, all the philosophies of life. We can say what, how humans can be fulfilled and be happy. Atheism. Atheism is pride. It's the sin of pride. Saying, I am so, I'm important in this world as long as I'm living here. But God is nothing. I have the freedom of being my own God. I have the freedom of saying that whatever I do is right. There's no morality. Whatever I say is moral. It's the law for my life and yours. You would think that at least they could keep the stupidities of themselves. all of these divisions that there are in the churches. When Jesus says in John's Gospel at the Last Supper 
Father, may they be one as we are one. It means unity. It means no one is allowed to change the words of Jesus or his intention or his goal. And his goal is to bring all men to home to the Father. His goal is to redeem all sinners. It's always all. Whatever he does for one, he does for all. We're not talking about human talents. We're talking about our connection to God. What do all these things do? They rob God of his glory. They rob God of his intention of why he created humanity. Pride is diabolic because it's the determination to do one's will over the will of God. Okay, so Satan saw it all. He, he figured he could take over from God completely. Have men worship him. And it's true. People do worship Satan when they sin. Seven capital sins. The anti-virtue. Look at how churches are being attacked at all times. All the will of God. Even the efforts of men to create a culture that is based on the scriptures and be even with all men, even in the question of justice and liberty and the pursuit of happiness, they all come from God. So it robs humanity from their own father. Yes. Jesus said, I do not leave you orphans. I am always with you. So do you call? I don't say, do you call? Do we call on God and know that he is here? That he is here. That he inspires our actions. Pride robs men of their spiritual healing, spiritual hearing, of their sight. If you don't have faith, we don't have spiritual sight. We don't see through the eyes of God. It opens the gate to all every other sin. Any sin you may want to mention, any sin at all, is basically the sin of pride. Doing one's will against the will of God. Brothers and sisters, connect your finger to the finger of Jesus. Connect them. One is Jesus and one is us. One is you. One is me. Are we connected? John's epistle is very clear. Read it and understand it. You don't call God, God called you. You didn't make God, God made you. When I was younger, I remember reading something that was pretty agnostic, and it says that humans have different religions because they work out in their minds the God they wish to create. wonder who created the gods that threw people into a volcano, who was diabolical, 
the God who created man to make him suffer. The one who created man to reject him. To give him doubts, to give him fears. To wonder whether or not he is good or evil. People didn't even bother with it. Let's look into the point of seeing whether or not we are connected to Jesus. And in the scripture of the epistle of John, he's here as close as he was when we saw him. Have the eyes of faith. Talk to him. And he will talk to you. Anywhere that you read that scripture and you pray on it, no matter where, where you read it and where you see it, you'll find a word for yourself in your moment of need from the moment of truth talk to him in faith Jesus declared as defining his essence I just open this up to you haphazardly Jesus of Nazareth embodies the incarnate word God's own son his word was sent to effect universal redemption and to proclaim the good news of the Father's merciful forgiveness. Let's say a little prayer. Father, thank you for sending your Son so not only we could know of your existence, but have the confirmation of having seen the perfect man, the perfect model, who gave us so much love that he died for us, that wherever we are, in whatever situation we are, if we follow his word, even in a confused way, even saying, I don't really understand it, find out that we are always the better for it. This has been written in every chapter of, of the listener's life. There have been things that went wrong through human pride the people not doing God's will of justice of consideration of simple respect. You've had many hurts from your childhood, from persons who were supposed to protect you. Right now, you have those who have, have no childhood. They're not here listening because they were destroyed and done away with because people did not even respect life that was not theirs. Was theirs to give, theirs to teach, theirs to model, theirs to bring into adulthood. But with one reason or another, they were done away with. Not only were they done away with before birth, there are those that were done are done away with after birth. As they grow, as they experience life around them, they are also rejected. Yes, we are in many ways rejected. But one person who will never reject us, never betray us, never 
have us unsafe is our Lord Jesus Christ. This will John connect to Jesus because he's here. He's here. Let's pray for each other.